Section six of the Wheels of Chance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Wheels of Chance by H. G. Wells. Chapter sixteen of the Artificial in Man and of the Zeitgeist. You have seen these two young people. Bechamel, by the by, is the man's name, and the girl's is Jesse Milton. From the outside, you have heard them talking. They ride now side by side, but not too close together, and in an uneasy silence toward Hazelmere, and this chapter will concern itself with those curious little council chambers inside their skulls, where their motives are in session and their acts are considered and passed. But first, a word concerning wigs and false teeth. Some jester, enlarging upon the increase of bald heads and purblind people, has deduced a wonderful feature for the children of men. Man, he said, was nowadays a hairless creature by forty or fifty, and for hair we give him a wig. Shriveled, and we patted him. Toothless, and lo, false teeth set in gold. Did he lose a limb? And a fine new artificial one was at his disposal. Get indigestion, and to hand was artificial digestive fluid, or bile, or pancreatine, as the case might be. Complexions, too, were replaceable, spectacles superseded an inefficient eye lens, and imperceptible false diaphragms were thrust into the failing ear. So he went over our anatomies until, at last, he had conjured up a weird thing of shreds and patches, a simulacrum, an artificial body of a man but with a doubtful germ of living flesh lurking somewhere in his recesses. To that, he held, we were coming. How far such odd substitution for the body is possible need not concern us now. But the devil, speaking by the lips of Mr. Rudyard Kipling, hath it that in the case of one Tomlinson, the thing, so far as the soul is concerned, has already been accomplished. Time was when men had simple souls, desires as natural as their eyes, a little reasonable philanthropy, a little reasonable philoprogenitiveness, hunger and a taste for good living, a decent personal vanity, a healthy, satisfying pugnacity, and so forth. But now we are taught and disciplined for years and years, and thereafter we read and read for all the time some strenuous, nerve-destroying business permits. Pedagogic hypnotists, pulpit and platform hypnotists, book-writing hypnotists, newspaper-writing hypnotists, are at us all. This sugar you are eating, they tell us, is ink, and forthwith we reject it with infinite disgust. This black draught of unrequited toil is true happiness, and down it goes with every symptom of pleasure. This isbin, they say, is dull past believing, and we yawn and stretch beyond endurance. Pardon, they interrupt, but this Isbin is deep and delightful, and we vie with one another in an excess of entertainment. And when we open the heads of these two young people we find, not a straightforward motive on the surface anywhere. We find, indeed, not a soul so much as an oversoul, a zeitgeist, a congestion of acquired ideas, a highway's feast of fine, confused thinking. The girl is resolute to live her own life, a phrase you may have heard before and the man has a pretty perverted ambition to be a cynical, artistic person of the very calmest description. He is hoping for the awakening of passion in her, among other things. He knows passion ought to awaken, from the textbooks he has studied. He knows she admires his genius, but he is unaware that she does not admire his head. He is quite a distinguished art critic in London, and he met her at that celebrated lady novelist, her stepmother, and here you have them well embarked upon the adventure. Both are in the first stage of repentance, which consists, as you have probably found for yourself, in setting your teeth hard and saying, I will go on. Things, you see, have jarred a little, and they ride on their way together with a certain aloofness of manner that promises ill for the orthodox development of the adventure. He perceives he was too precipitate, but he feels his honor is involved and meditates the development of a new attack. And the girl? She is unawakened. Her motives are bookish, written by a haphazard syndicate of authors, 
novelists, and biographers on her white inexperience. An artificial oversoul she is, that may presently break down and reveal a human being beneath it. She is still in that schoolgirl phase when a talkative old man is more interesting than a tongue-tied young one, and when to be an eminent mathematician, say, or to edit a daily paper, seems as fine an ambition as any girl need aspire to. Bechamel was to have helped her to obtain that in the most expeditious manner, and here he is beside her, talking enigmatical phrases about passion, looking at her with the oddest expression, and once, and that was his gravest offence, offering to kiss her. At any rate, he has apologized. She still scarcely realizes, you see, the scrape she has got into. CHAPTER Seventeen: THE ENCOUNTER AT MIDHURST We left Mr. Hoopdriver at the door of the little tea, toy, and tobacco shop. You must not think that a strain is put on coincidence when I tell you that next door to Mrs. Warder's, that was the name of the bright-eyed little old lady with whom Mr. Hoopdriver had stopped, is the Angel Hotel. And in the Angel Hotel, on the night that Mr. Hoopdriver reached Midhurst, were Mr. and Miss Beaumont, R. Beckhamel and Jessie Milton. Indeed, it was a highly probable thing, for if one goes through Guildford, the choice of southward roads is limited. You may go by Petersfield to Portsmouth, or by Midhurst to Chichester. In addition to which highways there is nothing for it but minor roadways to Petworth or Pulborough, and cross-cuts Brightonward. And coming to Midhurst from the north, the angel's entrance lies yawning to engulf your highly respectable cyclists, while Mrs. Warder's genial teapot is equally attractive to those who weigh their means in little scales. But to people unfamiliar with the Sussex roads, and such were the three persons of this story, the convergence did not appear to be so inevitable. Beckhamel, tightening his chain in the angel yard after dinner, was the first to be aware of their reunion. He saw Hoopdriver walk slowly across the gateway, his head and haloed in cigarette smoke, and pass out of sight up the street. Incontinently a mass of cloudy uneasiness, that had partially dispelled during the day, reappeared and concentrated rapidly into definite suspicion. He put his screw-hammer into his pocket and walked through the archway into the street, to settle the business forthwith, for he prided himself on his decision. Hoopdriver was merely promenading, and they met face to face. At the sight of his adversary, something between disgust and laughter seized Mr. Hoopdriver, and for a moment destroyed his animosity. "'Here we are again,' he said, laughing insincerely in a sudden outbreak at the perversity of chance. The other man in brown stopped short in Mr. Hoopdriver's way, staring. Then his face assumed an expression of dangerous civility. "'Is it any information to you,' he said with immense politeness, "'when I remark that you are following us?' Mr. Hoopdriver, for some occult reason, resisted his characteristic impulse to apologize. He wanted to annoy the other man in brown, and a sentence that had come into his head in a previous rehearsal cropped up appropriately. "'Since when?' said Mr. Hoopdriver, catching his breath, yet bringing the question out valiantly, none the less. "'Since when have you purchased the county of Sussex?' "'May I point out,' said the other man in brown, "'that I object, we object, not only to your proximity to us, to be frank, you appear to be following us with an object.' "'You can always,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, "'turn round, if you don't like it, or go back the way you came.' "'Oh, ho!' said the other man in brown. "'That's it. I thought as much.' "'Did you?' said Mr. Hoopdriver, quite at sea, but rising pluckily to the unknown occasion. "'What was the man driving at?' "'I see,' said the other man. "'I see. I have suspected—' His manner changed abruptly to a quality suspiciously friendly. "'Yes, a word with you.' You will, I hope, give me ten minutes. Wonderful things were dawning on Mr. Hoopdriver. What did the other man take him for? Here at last was reality. He hesitated. Then he thought of an admirable phrase. You have some communication? We'll call it a communication, said the other man. I can spare you the ten minutes, said Mr. Hoopdriver, with dignity. This way, then, said the other man in brown and they walked slowly down the North Street toward the grammar school. 
There was, perhaps, thirty-second silence. The other man stroked his moustache nervously. Mr. Hoopdriver's dramatic instincts were now fully awake. He did not quite understand in what role he was cast, but it was evidently something dark and mysterious. Dr. Conan Doyle, Victor Hugo, and Alexander Dumas were well within Mr. Hoopdriver's range of reading, and he had not read them for nothing. "'I will be perfectly frank with you,' said the other man in brown. "'Frankness is always the best course,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. "'Well, then, who the devil set you on this business?' "'Set me on this business? Don't pretend to be stupid. Who's your employer? Who engaged you for this job?' "'Well,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, confused, "'no, I can't say.' "'Quite sure?' the other man in brown glanced meaningfully down at his hand, and Mr. Hoopdriver, following him mechanically, saw a yellow milled edge glittering in the twilight. "'Now your shop assistant is just above the tip-receiving class, and only just above it, so that he is acutely sensitive on the point.' Mr. Hoopdriver flushed hotly, and his eyes were angry as he met those of the other man in brown. "'Stow it!' said Mr. Hoopdriver, stopping and facing the tempter. "'What?' said the other man in brown, surprised. Eh? And so saying, he stowed it in his breeches pocket. "'Do you think I'm to be bribed?' said Mr. Hoopdriver, whose imagination was rapidly expanding the situation. "'By gosh! I'd follow you now.' "'My dear sir,' said the other man in brown, "'I beg your pardon. I misunderstood you. I really beg your pardon. Let us walk on. In your profession. What have you got to say against my profession?' Well, really, you know, they are detectives of an inferior description, watchers, the whole class. Private inquiry, I did not realize. I really trust you will overlook what was, after all, you must admit, a natural indiscretion. Men of honor are not so common in the world, in any profession. It was lucky for Mr. Hoopdriver that in Midhurst they do not light the lamps in the summer time, or the one they were passing had betrayed him. As it was, he had to snatch suddenly at his mustache and tugged fiercely at it, to conceal the furious tumult of exaltation, the passion of laughter that came boiling up. Detective! Even in the shadow, Bechamel saw that the laugh was stifled, but he put it down to the fact that the phrase, men of honor, amused his interlocutor. He'll come round yet, said Bechamel to himself. He's simply holding out for a fiver. He coughed. I don't see that it hurts you to tell me who your employer is. Don't you? "'I do. Prompt,' said Bechamel appreciatively. "'Now here's the thing I want to put to you, the kernel of the whole business. You need not answer if you don't want to. There's no harm done in my telling you what I want to know. Are you employed to watch me or Miss Milton?' "'I'm not the leaky sort,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, keeping the secret he did not know with immense enjoyment. "'Miss Milton? That was her name. Perhaps he'd tell some more. "'It's no good pumping. Is that all you're after?' said Mr. Hoopdriver. Bechamel respected himself for his diplomatic gifts. He tried to catch a remark by throwing out a confidence. I take it there are two people concerned in watching this affair. "'Who's the other?' said Mr. Hoopdriver, calmly but controlling with enormous internal tension his self-appreciation. "'Who's the other?' was really brilliant, he thought. "'There's my wife and her stepmother. And you want to know which it is?' "'Yes,' said Bechamel. "'Well, arse them,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, his exultation getting the better of him, and with a pretty conscience of repartee. "'Arse them both!' Bechamel turned impatiently. Then he made a last effort. "'I'd give a five-pound note to know just the precise state of affairs,' he said. "'I told you to stow that,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, in a threatening tone, and added with perfect truth and magnificent mystery, "'You don't quite understand who you're dealing with but you will. He spoke with such conviction that he half believed that that detective office of his in London, Baker Street, in fact, really existed. With that the interview terminated. Bechamel went back to the angel, perturbed. Hang detectives! It wasn't the kind of thing he had anticipated at all. Hoopdriver, with round eyes and a wondering smile, walked down to where the mill waters glittered in the moonlight, and, after meditating over the parapet of the bridge for a space, with occasional mutters of private inquiry and the like, returned, with mystery even in his paces, towards the town. Chapter 18 
That glee, which finds expression in raised eyebrows and long, low whistling noises, was upon Mr. Hoopdriver. For a space he forgot the tears of the young lady in grey. Here was a new game, and a real one. Mr. Hoopdriver, as a private inquiry agent, a Sherlock Holmes, in fact, keeping these two people under observation. He walked slowly back from the bridge until he was opposite the angel, and stood for ten minutes, perhaps, contemplating that establishment and enjoying all the strange sensations of being this wonderful, this mysterious and terrible thing. Everything fell into place in his scheme. He had, of course, by a kind of instinct, assumed the disguise of a cyclist, picked up the first old crock that he came across as a means of pursuit. No expense was to be spared. Then he tried to understand what it was in particular that he was observing. My wife, her stepmother. Then he remembered her swimming eyes. Abruptly came a wave of anger that surprised him, washed away the detective superstructure, and left him plain Mr. Hoopdriver. This man in brown, with his confident manner and his proffered half-sovereign, damn him, was up to no good, else why should he object to being watched? He was married. She was not his sister. He began to understand. A horrible suspicion of the state of affairs came into Mr. Hoopdriver's head. Surely it had not come to that. He was a detective. He would find out. How was it to be done? He began to submit sketches on approval to himself. It required an effort before he could walk into the angel bar. A lemonade and bitter, please, said Mr. Hoopdriver. He cleared his throat. Are Mr. and Mrs. Bolong stopping here? What, a gentleman and a young lady, on bicycles? Fairly young, a married couple. No, said the barmaid, a talkative person of ample dimensions. There's no married couple stopping here, but there's a Mr. and Miss Beaumont. She spelt it for precision. Sure you've got the names right, young man? Quite, said Mr. Hoopdriver. Beaumont there is, but no one of the name of— "'What was the name you gave?' "'Bolong,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. "'No, there ain't no Bolong,' said the barmaid, taking up a glass cloth and a drying tumbler, and beginning to polish the latter. First off, I thought you might be asking for Beaumont, the names being similar. Were you expecting them on bicycles?' "'Yes, they said they might be in Midhurst to-night.' "'Perhaps they'll come presently. Beaumont's here, but no Bolong. Sure that Beaumont ain't the name?' "'Certain,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. It's curious the names being so alike. I thought, perhaps— And so they conversed at some length. Mr. Hoopdriver delighted to find his horrible suspicion disposed of. The barmaid, having listened a while at the staircase, volunteered some particulars of the young couple upstairs. Her modesty was much impressed by the young lady's costume, so she intimated, and Mr. Hoopdriver whispered the benedige natural to the occasion, at which she was coquettishly shocked. There'll be no knowing which is which in a year or two, said the barmaid. And her manner, too. She got off her machine and give it in to stick against the curb, and in she marched. I and my brother, she says, want to stop here to-night. My brother doesn't mind what kind of room he has, but I want a room with a good view, if there's one to be got, says she. He comes hurrying in after and looks at her. I've settled the rooms, she says. And he says, damn, just like that. I can fancy my brother letting me boss the show like that. I dare say you do, said Mr. Hoopdriver, if the truth was known. The barmaid looked down. She smiled and shook her head, put down the tumbler, polished, and took up another that had been draining, and shook the drops of water into her little zinc sink. She'll be a nice little lot to marry, said the barmaid. She'll be wearing the, well, bedashes, as the saying is. I can't think what girls is coming to. This depreciation of the young lady in grey was hardly to Hoopdriver's taste. Fashion, said he, taking up his change, fashion is all the go with you ladies, and always was. You'll be wearing em yourself before a couple years is out. Nice they'd look on my figure, said the barmaid, with a titter. No, I ain't one of your fashionable sort. Gracious, no. I should feel as if I'd anything on me, not more than if I'd forgot. Well, there, I'm talking. She put down the glass abruptly. I dare say I'm old-fashioned, she said, and walked humming down the bar. Not you, said Mr. Hoopdriver. He waited until he caught her eye, and then, with his native courtesy, smiled, raised his cap, and wished her good evening. Chapter 14 
Then Mr. Hoopdriver returned to the little room with the lead-framed windows where he had dined, and where the bed was now comfortably made, sat down on the box under the window, stared at the moon rising on the shining vicarage roof, and tried to collect his thoughts. How they whirled at first! It was past ten, and most of Midhurst was tucked away in bed. Someone up the street was learning the violin, at rare intervals a belated inhabitant hurried home, and woke the echoes and a corn crake kept up a busy churning in the vicarage garden. The sky was deep blue, with a still luminous afterglow along the black edge of the hill, and the white moon overhead, save for a couple of yellow stars, had the sky to herself. At first his thoughts were kinetic, of deeds and not relationships. There was this malefactor and his victim, and it had fallen on Mr. Hoopdriver to take a hand in the game. He was married. Did she know he was married? Never for a moment did a thought of evil concerning her cross Hoopdriver's mind. Simple-minded people see questions of morals so much better than superior persons, who have read and thought themselves complex to impotence. He had heard her voice, seen the frank light in her eyes, and she had been weeping. That sufficed. The rights of the case he hadn't properly grasped, but he would. And that smirking, well, swine was the mildest for him he recalled the exceedingly unpleasant incidents of the railway bridge. "'Then we won't detain you. Thanks,' said Mr. Hoopdriver aloud, in a strange, unnatural, contemptible voice, supposed to represent that of Beckhamo. "'Oh, the beggar! I'll be level with him yet. He's afraid of us detectives. That I'll swear. If Mrs. Werder should chance to be on the other side of the door within earshot, well and good.' For a space he meditated chastisements and revenges, physical impossibilities for the most part, Bechamel staggering headlong from the impact of Mr. Hoopdriver's large, but, to tell the truth, ill-supported fist, Bechamel's five-foot-nine of height lifted from the ground and quivering under a vigorously applied horsewhip. So pleasant was such dreaming that Mr. Hoopdriver's peaked face under the moonlight was transfigured. One might have paired him with that well-known and universally admired triumph, The Soul's Awakening so sweet was his ecstasy. And presently, with his thirst for revenge glutted by six or seven violent assaults, a duel and two vigorous murders, his mind came round to the young lady in grey again. She was a plucky one, too. He went over the incident the barmaid at the angel had described to him. His thoughts ceased to be a torrent, smoothed down to a mirror in which she was reflected with infinite clearness and detail. He'd never met anything like her before. Fancy that bolster of a barmaid being dressed in that way. He wuffed a contemptuous laugh. He compared her color, her vigor, her voice, with the young ladies in business with whom his lot had been cast. Even in tears she was beautiful, more beautiful indeed to him, for it made her seem softer and weaker, more accessible. And such weeping as he had seen before had been so much a matter of damp white faces, red nose, and hair coming out of curl. Your draper's assistant becomes something of a judge of weeping, because weeping is the custom of all young ladies in business, when for any reason their services are dispensed with. She could weep, and, by gosh, she could smile. He knew that, and reverting to acting abruptly, he smiled confidently at the puckered pallor of the moon. It is difficult to say how long Mr. Hoopdriver's pensiveness lasted. It seemed a long time before his thoughts of action returned. Then he remembered that he was a watcher that to-morrow he must be busy. It would be in character to make notes, and he pulled out his little notebook. With that in hand he fell a-thinking again. Would that chap tell her the texts were after them? If so, would she be as anxious to get away as he was? He must be on the alert. If possible he must speak to her. Just a significant word. Your friend, trust me. It occurred to him that to-morrow these fugitives might rise early to escape. At that he thought of the time and found it was half-past eleven. Lord, he said, I must see that I wake. He yawned and rose. The blind was up, and he pulled back the little chintz curtains to let the sunlight strike across the bed, hung his watch within good view of his pillow, on a nail that supported a kettle-holder, and sat down on his bed to undress. He lay awake for a little while, thinking of the wonderful possibilities of the morrow, and thence he passed gloriously into the wonderland of dreams. End of section 6